Thank you, Beth. People need the Lord. Amen? Amen. Wonderful song. Thank you. Oftentimes get a good trip down memory lane with some of those songs. Really. I grew up singing that song in the Methodist Church. How many of you have ever been to Disneyland? Disney World? Any of that? Okay, yeah. Um, I grew up in Central California, just a little outside of Sacramento near the airbase there. And so as a consequence, we weren't that far from Disneyland, so we made it down there a few times. I remember one of my earliest times, uh, my dad was leading our Boy Scout troop and he took us down there to Disneyland. And I remember my dad was just enamored with the submarine ride. And we must have went on that thing two or three times. And that was back in the days when you had to buy the tickets. Remember that? Not just one price. You, just, you had to pay the E tickets and the C tickets and A tickets and all of that kind of crazy things. And uh, so we, we enjoyed that. My favorite uh, ride was, was and still is the Pirates of the Caribbean. Yes. Love that ride. Two reasons I like the ride. One is because uh, of the... Uh, fact that uh, Southern California in the summer can get a little bit on the warm side and when you go into the parts of the Caribbean it's nice and cool in there. It's all enclosed and, and uh, just great. Plus, you kind of just get into another world, don't you? You're, just, you're surrounded by all these things and you have to go on the ride several times to catch the little nuances of it. And I remember after the movie came out with Johnny Depp, um, did you notice if you've been there that they redid the characters so Johnny Depp's face was on the main pirate down there. And uh, so if you've not seen that, check it out next time you go down. Uh, if not, take my word for it. But uh, it's, a, it's a really a good, good time. So the happiest plan on earth. Now, when we first noticed, I will confess this, this was a typo that I had that, uh, and Joni just thought it was the happiest plan on earth, so that's what got there. But really, that's what our message tonight, to this morning, is. Not only the happiest place on earth, but the happiest plan on earth. So, notice the left one, it says, when I find out that the price is for food in Disneyland, kind of gets shut and smoked, doesn't it? You know, for the $15 hot dog and you know, all that good stuff. I like the little guy right there. Do you see him? Uh, he's just overjoyed standing next to a fairy. Okay, that's whatever. Notice Mickey on the left. He might be taking some time off. I don't know. Pick, catching up on his reading. I'm not sure really what he is doing. And the, the next, the guy over there walking with his daughter, I like him. This guy's kind of father of the year in my opinion. Okay, takes a man to be able to walk around with uh, fins and uh, with his daughter too. Not to mention the fact those fins look like they're hard to walk in, so I don't enough walking as it is, so that might be kind of interesting. I don't know what the beast is doing here, but the kids are obviously not getting a bird's eye view of the park, all right? But having been one of those characters, not at Disneyland, but I did a stint one time as Smokey the Bear at a school. And those, those interesting costumes are that you have zip peripheral vision in them. You can only see about like right here. You've got uh, character glaucoma, I think. You can just see a little bit right there. And so you have to kind of, that's why a lot of these characters are waving. And I waved a lot because if I didn't wave, I didn't know where my hands were and I probably smacked the kid halfway in the head. Didn't want to do that, not good for uh, public relations. So these poor kids didn't get to see much. And this one sums it up for me. I don't know if they've been one too many times on the Matterhorn or if they really did see the prices, you know, if some of the souvenirs, but the happiest place on earth I'm not sure these folks are buying it. What do you think? All right. Yeah, I just love these guys. Kind of frowny. They've got sunglasses on. Even the one kid in the front didn't want to look at the camera. Let's take a look at the last couple of chapters in Revelation. We've been spending uh, the last number of weeks going uh, chapter by chapter through the last book of the Bible, and we've already looked at and discovered um, we've taken more of a, or I have, I've taken more of a symbolic approach 
the amillennial, if you want a fancy word for it, approach to it, where uh, there's a lot of symbols and there's a lot of uh, um, things that stand for other things. And uh, we have seen that the beast is destroyed. We have seen that Satan is thrown into a pit and uh, he's taken care of. And so we really get these last couple of chapters in Revelation uh, describing uh, heaven and describing it as a very wonderful place. In Revelation, I'm not going to read every verse from, one, from Revelation 21, 22, but uh, some of the key ones. Then I, John, who's in this revelation, who's seeing it, who everything's opened up here, and poor guy has to try to take notes on it and figure out what's going on. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. How fascinating. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, let me pause a moment. And remember in our study, we went, go back to the book of Genesis sometime, and you read some of the first chapter or first verses in Genesis, and you find that God is doing what? You remember that he is hovering over the face of the water, which is interesting because water wouldn't be created yet. But why is he hovering over the surface of the water? Well, in the time that this was being written, the, um, the Canaanites uh, have worshipped water deities. That's hard to say fast. They worshipped water de deities. And uh, things that came out of the water, Loch Ness Monster, all that kind of good stuff. That's what they worshipped. That's who they focused on. And so God is pictured in the beginning, the first words in the scripture, as going over those waters and thus more powerful. And notice what gets wiped out right here. No longer any sea. Oh, rats, we don't get the seashore. We're going to have something much better, I do believe. I saw the holy city of the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. We saw that, that uh, picture uh, last week. And I heard a loud voice from the throne of God saying, Look, God is now among the people, and he shall dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. The dwelling place is there. Okay, got a slide wrong there. Okay. He will wipe away, look, every tear from their eye. Isn't that wonderful? You can just look at that one and, and meditate on that if you wanted to. Um... Unfortunately, Johnson & Johnson has it wrong. There aren't no more tears, okay? Not in this world, not in the midst of a pandemic, not in the midst of governmental chaos, not in the midst of all the other nonsense that's going on all around the world, including the persecution of Christians that's happening today. And, but yet there is a time when he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There's nothing to cry about, why? because everything is perfect and beautiful. People need the Lord, and just like Beth played for us so beautifully earlier. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. The old order of things has passed away. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the last plagues came down and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. The city had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. One of the gates were written the 12 names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates of the east, three to the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who had talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, and as long as it was wide, he measured the city with the road and found it to be twelve thousand stadia in length and as wide and high 
as it is long. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. It was made of jasper, and the city was pure gold, as pure as glass. Can you envision that? Envision something like that? The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, second sapphire, third agate, fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh uh, chrysolite, uh, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh genus, and the twelfth amethyst. And if I mispronounce those, uh, well, you'll get over it. Um, the twelve tribes, uh, the twelve gates were the twelve pearls. Each gate was made from a single pearl. Keep that in mind. The great streets of the city was of gold. Now see, there's the streets of gold over here, right? Mentioned almost every funeral ceremony you'll attend, including the ones that I do. Streets of gold as pure as transparent glass. Wow. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of the Lord gives it its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. Wow. Don't need any light. No electric bills, no PG&E, no, you know, blackouts, you know, having to worry about any of that kind of stuff. The light is constant. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the light is of the lamp. And no day will the gates ever be shut. There will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does not, uh, who is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's pray together for a moment. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your word, for its simplicity and its complexity. We thank you for the symbols and signs that we have seen here. Help us to understand them. Help us, Father, not to only be informed this morning, but transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we may know what your will is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Speak to us today through your will, through your humble servant, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know about you folks, but that is a happy ending to a story, right? And we can say with confidence that they'll live happily ever after? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you see here, uh, you know, people have always just asked interesting questions when they find out you're a minister. People will ask all sorts of cool stuff, interesting stuff, maybe silly stuff sometimes. That's okay. I'm glad to answer anything as much as I can. Um, People say, are there golf in heaven? Sure. Matter of fact, I can make a case of Bob McAllister's designing some courses up there. You know, it's all, all could be very much a part of that. Um, you know, heaven, they want it as a garden, like the Garden of Eden. And certainly, well, we'll see that a little bit more as we get into the next chapter. But is it a city? Well, yeah. The new city of Jerusalem laid down. Now, there's two, well, there's many ways to read the book of Revelation. We've looked at a few of those. In reading something about the new city, Jerusalem, there's really two ways that we can read this. And as I've said before, there are many different views on the book of Revelation. And uh, any of those views are fine because it is a non-salvation issue. What I mean by that is that you can read this as being literal. You can read it as being symbolic and still understand that you're a Christian, which is the most important thing for going to heaven, right? And I've told you before that uh, in our community, the pastor over at Grace Church, uh, Brother John, I've told him I've used him in a lot of sermons, and uh, you know, he and I have completely different views on this, but I remember telling him that, uh, you know what, you believe in the rapture, I don't. So if we do get raptured up, you can knock me on the, hit me on the shoulder and say, ha ha, I told ya. And I gave you perfect permission to do that. That's fine. 
The point is that no matter what you believe about all this stuff, if you're a Christian this morning, you're going to heaven. You get to enjoy this good stuff. Amen? Amen. So for goodness gracious, don't get in any kind of dispute or argument about this kind of stuff. Our world doesn't need any more arguments, right? And definitely not out of the church. But we see this city coming down, and the text writes down some of the measurements that you see. It mentions it is 12,000 stratia, which one of those ends up being about 607 feet long. So if you do the math, it's roughly about 1,379 miles long. Okay, this is the temple, 1,379, if I did my math right, miles long, wide, and high, or roughly the distance between Portland to Denver. Okay, that's a long distance, right? Huge distance. And it's huge because it's laid out in a square, as you remember. And so if it's that tall and that wide and that long, wide, and high, that's a huge distance. And we may think, wow, that's it. Okay, but then if you think about who's going to be in heaven, the people who have followed God from the beginning of the age all the way up through now and in the future before the Lord comes. I don't know about you, that seems like kind of a large number. And I, personally, I th I'm not sure everybody would fit in that dimension. Don't you? And we're certainly not going to be crowded. I mean, we might feel like we're sardines, stacked 1,300 miles high. How fun would that be? So maybe, and that's a literal reading, and again, if that's where you want to go, that's perfectly fine. And they will get there, and that's the distance. Or, it could be the fact that 12 thousand stradia. Twelve is a complete number, as we've talked about before. Twelve is twelve tribes of Israel, and you find that mentioned a number of times through that Genesis, the uh, Revelation chapter uh, 20 passage. And then we've also discussed that a thousand years, in some reading, may not be a thousand years. It's a number that nobody can calculate, kind of an infinity. It's a huge number. And we notice that a thousand is ten times ten times ten. Again, perfect numbers. Make sense? In other words, we're going to be in a place where the dimensions are absolutely immeasurable. Because we're going to be with a crowd of people that are immeasurable. We found earlier in Revelation there was a there was a multi remember the 144,000 that we talked, excuse me, that we talked about. Right after that, talked about a multitude of people that no one could count. And that's who's all going to be in heaven. And here's the point. We don't have to count them. Okay? We're not the census takers. Why? Because a lot of people are going to be there. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the things I'm excited about is I'm excited about seeing people that have gone on before me and that I'd like to see my mom died when I was 17. I can't wait for Joni to meet her. And my grandkids, when they get there. And hanging out with Paul, Peter. All these kind of folks. Hanging out with some of you, who we enjoy hanging out with and love spending time with. And after we spend time together, we go, oh, I really wish that this evening could go on and on. Don't you ever wish that? You're out with good friends and you're having a great time. And ah, oh, yeah, we gotta go, we gotta go home and get to bed, put the kids in bed, whatever you're doing. And you wish you could stay longer. And say, Bruce and I, you know, we enjoy hanging out, drink coffee. You know what? We just, hey, let's do that for about 500 years. Bruce, what do you think? Right. And as that hymn teaches us, we no less days to see God's praise than what? Than when we first begun. So then I can spend another 500 years with John and we can hang out, make music. Maybe we'll all be making music, who knows? Maybe I'll actually learn how to play the guitar right. You know, I mean, miracles can happen in heaven, eh? All sorts of things. Let's keep reading. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life. 
as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God at the land. Down the middle of the street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12, um, know that number again, 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. <laughs> wow, that'd be cool. That's what I call a growing season. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and the servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. You remember the group of people who are of the world? Don't want to follow God? Don't want anything to do with him? What mark did they get? The mark, yeah, 666, we talked about the ultimate incompleteness. It's on their hand, and where? On their, whose name do we get? Who? We belong to Jesus. There'll be no more night. There'll be no need of a lamp, or a light, or a lamp. For the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. We start breaking out with the Hallelujah Chorus, we'll be okay with that. Oops. Notice the gates. See, there are streets of heaven we talked about. Did you read the pearls? There are pearly gates. And did you notice in there that though each gate is made out of one pearl? One pearl. Each gate, one pearl. 1996, this is the largest pearl ever discovered. It's in the Philippines. It was more than two feet long. That's the largest one mankind has ever unearthed. Now, if each of those gates, assuming the gates are over two feet tall, maybe they're munchkin gates, I don't know. Okay, but assuming they're more than two feet tall, <laughs> you have oyster overtime, don't you? All right, in terms of making those huge gates, one pearl. And see, the greatest place on earth, the greatest plant on earth, features not only a beautiful city in an urban setting, but also features a river. I've got a river of life flowing out of me, makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Remember that chorus? Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Now we're supposed to spring up, okay? Kids saw it, been doing camps too many years, all right? Well, that's a great theology, and it comes right here from the book of Revelation, this river of life that we have. And the fact that we have a new heaven and a new earth. We've talked about this before. Greek thought in those days, Platonistic thought, taught us that spirit is good and physical is evil. That's not a biblical thought. It is Greek thought. And it's false. And how do we know that? Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the what? Earth. earth which means earth is also a creation of God. Now, we've spent the last thousands of years screwing it up, and we've spent the last number of years uh, having it live under the curse of sin, and we don't know any better because, candidly, we haven't seen Eden, have we? But we will, and we will see a new earth. And again, we think, now, wait a minute, I want to be up in heaven. Of course, we never do realize it's really up, or hell is down there. Down there is the, the mantle, the crust, the core. Probably got those in the wrong order. And then a geology class in a while. But hell is not down there. Heaven's not up there. It's in places we can't even fathom. God explained it to us. But we do know that there's no more sunlight or moonlight needed, no more tears, suffering, pain, or death, bitterness, pain, evil. We have the peace that passes all understanding, joy unspeakable. Amen? And really, the only thing we need to be worried about right now is that, A, am I going? Do I understand Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Have I given my life over to Him? Have 
I buried myself in baptism? Have I risen again in the news of life? Do I accept him as my Lord? Then we're going. We're going tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. It doesn't really matter. Because in the midst of all this nonsense that's going on in the world, three words I want to give to you today. Three words, you know these. Four words, sorry. God is in what? Control. Isn't he? You believe that? God is in control. Say it a little louder so I know you're not falling asleep. God is in control. Yeah, do you believe that? Amen. Or as the old, as the old song gives it to us, poet, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I sure know who holds tomorrow. I know, I know who holds the future. And it's under his design. And if you're like me, God's pretty good about not giving us the memo, really, about what's happening. Why? Because we wouldn't understand it if he explained it to us in the simplest ways, which he has through the scripture, through his spirit. But it's like explaining physics to my three-year-old granddaughter. She'll look at me just as cute as could be. She'll be glued to every word and not have a clue what I'm saying. Fine. But she does know that I love her. And when I hold her, I'm protecting her and picking her up and just loving on her. That's all she's worried about. And candidly, that's what we need to be worried about too. Because, because religion, I hate that word, um, but faith and everything is not in a belief system or a theology or anything like that. It's in a person. It is in the person of Jesus Christ who watches over each one of us. He knows how many hairs we have on our head. He knows when a bird falls out of a tree. He knows everything intimately about us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Isn't that wonderful? And so he knows what we need, when we need it, how we need it. And prayer isn't informing God, or as we get, this will come as a shock to many of you, I know, but I'm just going to rock your world right now. There are people in the church that complain. There are. Would you believe it? And people will call and they'll complain. I put my name on the prayer list and you misspelled my nephew's name. Well, that means nobody's going to pray for your nephew because, you know, God's not going to know a misspelling in a name. <laughs> Don't believe that. Your nephew is prayed for. Whether we get the name spelled right or not, he knows things about us that maybe we aren't going to share with anybody candidly. And that's okay. He has searched us. He knows us. He knows when we rise up, when we're near, when we're afar. He knows us. How many here are looking forward to going to heaven? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I want to close the series out with a story. It's not exactly a joke. But it's an old story. It's an old legend. Probably not true, but you know what? The imagery is something that just speaks to me every time I read it. So I'm going to share it with you. Now, first few lines are going to be the setup to every joke you've ever heard, all right? There was a guy who died and went to heaven. How many jokes do you know to start with that? Okay. So this guy goes to heaven. I'm not going to mention the pearly gates, although they're tall. They're each made out of one pearl. You can now know that and tell that to somebody. If I ruin the joke, they're going to tell you. But here we go. So he's, he's up there. He's talking, or wherever he is. And... Uh, the angel asks him, he says, well, I've got a question for you. Do you want to go to heaven or hell? That's kind of shocked. Well, can you show me both? Sure, if you want. Let's check out hell. So they go to hell. And they're, they're in a long, probably twice as wide as this aisle, and in a banquet room that's 15 times as long as this aisle right here. Okay, Big, long table. Both sides. People sitting on both sides. Wonderful food and smells as far as the eye can see. It's just 
wonderful. Guy's mouth started to water because he's a little bit hungry. And so as he's looking, the people have forks getting ready to dig in. The trick is the forks are mounted on these long poles that are about eight feet tall. All right? And so as they try to try to get the food, they can stab it, fine, but they can't make the turn to get it back around to their mouth. So you see an image in hell where you got people starving to death, surrounded by some of the best food in the world. And he goes, whoa, that just doesn't sound like anything. I'm not going for it. Let me see heaven. Okay. Next place they go, same table, same room, same dimensions, same food, although it smells better, same forks, big and long. And the guy says, okay, hey, help me here. I'm not seeing a whole bunch of difference here. He says, well, watch for a minute. And you notice the people were taking the forks instead of trying to turn those long forks around to each other. They simply had the forks and they were feeding each other. Is that not where our world needs to be today? Is that not what the mission of the church needs to be? Isn't that what we need to be doing as Christians as we are helping this world? Not trying to see what I get out of it, but how I can help. I can love, I can pray, I can encourage, I can listen, I can help strengthen people. The light of Christ in me can share other people and feed them in ways that the world can't even consider feeding them and helping them and preparing them for the place where there will be no more tears. There will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering. A place that many of us are sure, yeah, I know I'm going, but let's just not hold it on as an insurance policy, folks. Let's take it on as a lifestyle. There's enough room in heaven for everybody, is there not? There's enough room in heaven for somebody that you know, a neighbor, could be a friend, a relative, co-worker, schoolmate, whoever it is. There's room for you today. And as the worship team comes, and as they share with us, really this kind of upbeat uh, Gaither song. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Right? Here's the thing about that soon part. And that could be tomorrow. He could come before the Super Bowl. Hope he does come before the Super Bowl. No, I can say that. <laughs> you don't. Yeah, you want to watch Tom Brady. Okay, I know that. So maybe he'll come after the Super Bowl. All right. Are you ready? Are other people being made ready? Are we encouraging? That's our question for the day as the worship team sings and shares and if you are thinking, well, I'd like to kind of know for sure I'm ready. Or uh, I have a prayer concern. Uh, we have a number of prayer concerns. We have uh, Teed Nail, maybe you know Teed. Teed went into the hospital at the uh, great urging of his wife, like many of us go in the hospital only when our wife pretty well forces us to go there. He had been having some chest pains and some weaknesses and everything. Uh, they did an angiogram yesterday and found a couple of blockages, so they're going to be doing bypass surgery on him tomorrow. So we need to keep Keith and Lynn in our prayers. We need to keep uh, the, um, uh, the, sorry, the uh, McAllister uh, family. Am I missing anybody here? Well, Luann is here today. In the back, so. Amen. So good when we see the answers to prayer. Amen. Amen. What a, what a deal. So, let's stand together as the worship team leads us today.